Everyone, this is Joshua Namari. He's a graduate student in uh, graphic design here at EMB in the MFA program. Joshua's from Idaho, and uh, he's his major interest area. He'll probably tell you more about it. He's in, interested in graphic design and exhibition design for the environment. So, Thanks. 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 It took a while to figure out exactly how to narrow it, or yeah, take what I had and put it down in a specific <laughs> term. So I call it nature's graphics, and it's uh, graphic design's historic influence on American behavior, not the which is not cool. But um, so you'll see some things hopefully that you you're familiar with, and maybe you can expose expose to some new ideas behind the cloud. So the first first section I have is I have a lot of different sections in this presentation um, about just a lot of different little things that I found in graphic design that influence um, the, our behavior in the outdoors. Um, first section is America, appreciating America's outdoors and how we kind of began our fascination with, with the outdoors. Um, as a young nation, America sought some sort of claim, claim for nationalism. We wanted to have pride in our nation. Um, we were young. Europe, uh, you know, they, they have this this history of, of culture and of, of the arts. They had a, a longer, fairly long-term government there. But uh, America was a brand new fledgling nation. We didn't have um, a lot to, you know, to be proud of. So we were looking for for some sort of national superiority. At about this time, there was this westward expansion. Um, here, you're looking at uh, these top images we have uh, since before Albert Beard says, uh, the Rocky Mountains from 1863. So it's, it's you know, good almost 100 years after the, the foundation of the Declaration of Independence. But uh, there's this westward expansion. Um, before, there was Niagara Falls, um, there's Appalachian Mountains in the east, and you know, Europe had things that were you know, pretty comparable to those sorts of natural wonders. But then, once we expanded to the West Coast, we got the, the Pacific Northwest, we got the California and the Southwest from, uh, uh, from the world of Mexico, and then with that, we got uh, we got Yosemite. That's what's uh, depicted up in the top one here, the Sierra Nevadas. And we got the, the giant uh, sequoia redwoods too. Um, and these were some things that we could uh, we could claim as this natural natural culture. This uh, superiority that we have. These were comparable to the Swiss Alps, and uh, it works with graphic design because a lot of these works. This is an engraving by Edward Bierstadt, not the same as the as the painter who did the, the top painting up there. Um, but they were saying that these uh, these mountains were comparable to to the Swiss Alps, and look at these these cultures that are in here um, that are. Um, Part of our heritage that we've now inherited as we've gone and met our manifest destiny and going from coast to coast. Um, so these artworks, you know, they were um, they were transferred to popular media through woodcuts and through engraving, so they could get into the newspapers. We talked about that um, in class before. Um, but there was this, yeah, I guess the point here is the unrivaled natural heritage that we have now. We have hidden at the school to keep the green on. Here's a, a perfect example of it. Um, these are the, the giant sequoias. This one is actually the mother of the forest. Um, this one has oh. But the mother of the forest was this giant sequoia, and it has the stats here. I don't know if you are legible for that. Yes. Okay. So this is like a, an amazing tree. 300 feet. 305 feet high, 63 feet in circumference. They took the bark off. You, know, you can see up in here, they put some scaffolding around it, took the bark off. And these are some etchings, actually, that people would take because they had such an interest in this. They took the bark off and they actually reconstructed it for some, like, some exhibits because this was such an amazing thing. Um, you know, there was actually a private person who paid about thirty to $40,000, which was an amazing amount of money back then. Actually, an interesting side note is this uh, painting up here went for $25,000, which was the highest amount any American artist at that point had ever received for work of art. So it was something that was you know, very new and exciting to Americans. But this, uh, yeah, this was exciting 
for these people that got it to publish some newspapers about this, um, about this great wonder. Um, and a lot of people thought, in Europe especially, thought it was kind of a mythical thing. Um, so they actually uh, took it to the Crystal Palace, which we've talked about before. They had a great exhibition there. <coughs> and so they displayed the shell that they took off of the tree from the previous, example, um, previous slides, and they reassembled it here. And so people were these private individuals who had um, taken these trees, or this tree out of there, um, reassembled it, showed it off, got a little bit of money for doing it, you know, from people, they brought profits to um, the people who came and viewed it. It also brought validity to America's claims of a natural heritage. It was no longer just this, this uh, made up story that these, you know, Yankees, as the book I was reading called it, um, made up to, to say, to try to sell themselves as this powerful, great nation because of our natural heritage. Um, and it also got a lot of reaction from conservationists to the monumentalism, which is more, you know, the idea that because of these huge things, we're, we're great and huge. Um, but that's precisely what the beginnings of this um, outdoor movement was about. Um, and so some of the reaction is like uh, John Muir, um, a great conservationist of the past, um, he he began doing some writing. I put it in this slide because the, the page proportions on it on there it seemed like it was a perfect uh, proportion there. Um, but those are some of the books that he he had printed that uh, that talk about um, about uh, understanding the outdoors and our connection to them. And they talk appreciation for natural wonders and that they're not based just on their scenic impact. And these things, these works, these books. Um, for example, the images um, are, are encouraging us to, to know the land and protect it. You can see in this bottom one, uh, John Muir was also uh, trying to get things done through political action. He's there with Teddy Roosevelt um, in Yosemite National Park in um, John Muir was actually also the founder of the Sierra Club. Um, their mission is to enjoy, protect the bottom places of your unknown memories here. Hold on, I'm not sure my, my take on it, but I thought I'd just bring that up as a little known organization. Um, the preface of John Muir's book here, called Our National Parks, it says, In this book, made up of sketches, first published in the Atlantic Monthly, I've done the best I could to show forth the beauty, grandeur, and all embracing usefulness of our wild mountain forests, reservations, and parks, with a view to inciting the people to come and enjoy them and get them into their hearts. That so it like the preservation of the white use might be made sure. So he was a little bit, you know, those were pretty involved at the Crystal Palace exhibit of, you know, stripping this great tree, which, you know, with its bark on, it's going to die. It's, it's going to be exposed to all the elements, exposed to any fire and snow, all those different things, and it's and insects, and it'll uh, be destroyed. Um, so these were the opposition reactions. 